Byrne, I'd like to announce that we had an executive session to discuss the personnel and litigation matters. I'll give folks a minute or two to take a look at the minutes, and then when folks are ready, we can have a motion. Mr. Chairman, I have an announcement at 2.20. I have a hard stop. I have another commitment. Okay, thanks, Lewis. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you waiting for corrections to the minutes? Yes. Oh, there, I'm not Mr. Stewart. I'm sorry? I read till the end. I'm not Mr. Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stewart seconded whatever. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> he wasn't here that day. Wrong gender, wrong right. side. Conferencing center. We will. We will correct. Oh, good. We will correct the. You're, you're there, right? We call Dr. Stewart, uh, Mr. Stewart. If you need technical assistance during your call, press star zero. You are the first caller to this conference. Please wait while others join. So Caroline, are you, she's not there, I guess. Okay, can I have a motion for approval? And, and, and if there are no additional edits. So Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions, okay. All right, so we have uh, one speaker uh, in terms of public comments on agenda items. Is that? You can do your three minute thing. Huh? Yes. Um, and the first speaker is Matt Mihalik on the Breathe project. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the PM 2.5 SIP demonstration. On the positive side, we're pleased that the department has gotten around to addressing this issue. Allegheny County was required to submit a moderate area attainment plan to EPA no later than October 15, 2016. It was notified in the Federal Register on April 6, 2018 for their failing to submit a state implementation plan for the 2012 air quality standards. The fact that this plan has been drafted and will be available for public comment is a notable milestone, another example of ACHD's ongoing efforts to get out from under a significant backlog of air quality responsibilities, such as expired Title V permits, tepid past enforcement actions, and weak regulatory actions. Thank you for your ongoing process of improvement. You're beginning to align with expectations. From another perspective, this current SIP modeling provides the impression that the goal is to just do the minimum to meet a, a design value for 12 micrograms per cubic meter from the Liberty Monitor, a value that really means straddling the line between whether the county's air is lawful or unlawful with respect to the Clean Air Act. ACHD is primarily a health department, not just an ordinary air district regulatory agency. What we know from the health literature is that it makes sense to pursue a goal that's well below the line between lawful and unlawful. We know that health effects start showing up at levels above 8 micrograms per cubic meter, and that the World Health Organization sets 10 <laughs> micrograms per cubic meter as its recommendation for average annual PM. At those levels, 50% of Pittsburgh's population is currently being exposed to annual PM levels above 10 micrograms per cubic meter. <coughs> what this means is that the attainment demonstration should aim for the more protective standard. The SIP draft currently does not require any additional reasonable available control technologies for the Claritin Coke Works, which just demonstrated over the past four months that quote unquote control needs to be interpreted rather loosely to justify the designation of meeting reasonable available control technologies in this SIP. Aiming higher to protect health also means not taking premature victory laps, as is the impression you gave the media from your press release about the Liberty Monitor earlier this week, indicating that an annual mean value of 11.5 micrograms per cubic meter, which would be lower than the EPA standard of 12, Again, this suggests straddling the line between lawful and unlawful is somehow a laudable target. Half a minute. This annual average can be explained partially by the air outside of the county getting cleaner because of coal-fired power plant closures and by an unusual low number of weather inversion events in 2018. Sound science means using caution about attributing this monitor's performance Please to department action. 
More recent data suggests that Liberty Monitor mean value of 12.67 micrograms per cubic meter for the first quarter of 2019, according to Clean Air Council's calculations. Your time is up. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to old business. Um, Mr. Kelly is going to talk about uh, enforcement update. All right, I'm going to just say something. I do think uh, it is important to note that this is the lowest uh, value of PM 2.5 that we've had at the Liberty Monitor ever. While there is much work to be done, we have to make sure that U.S. Steel does not backslide, which is what we had seen in 16 and 17. We are proud of the progress that has been made, and we do believe that a lot of that has to do with our massive changes that we've made to our um, air program and our air quality program and the uh, and very large volume enforcement actions that have been done. So uh, while we do absolutely agree that the work is yet to be done, there is no question there is so much more to do. We do feel uh, pleased to see that that is the lowest value that we have ever had at the Liberty Monitor. So with that, I'm going to let Jim talk more about the enforcement actions. Okay. Um, again, um, I'm the Deputy Director for the Environmental Health Program. There are five programs. I'm going to give an update on enforcement action in these five programs. For these programs, there's not a whole lot going on with those, and so I'll go through those fairly quickly. For our Water Pollution Control and Solid Waste Management Program, uh, we have two open enforcement cases currently. Um, for the year, we've actually already had 30 NOVs. Um, at this time last year, we had 24. Now, the reason for that is um, what has happened is we have a three-year schedule for pump station um, investigations and, in, and um, as well as inspections, and we've come up upon that. And so this uh, exceptionally large number of NOVs is because of those inspections and all the minor infractions that you find at the, the pump station. So for the rest of the year, you won't probably have as many NOVs. We've had 25 complaints um, so far this year. It's 125 in 2018. For solid waste, that's a notice of violation. Okay, so when you find something, and a notice of violation can be a lot of different things. It could be something in the paperwork to affluent. I mean, so it's pretty broad. And so that's, that's usually the first part of any type of enforcement action. First is a letter of NOV. There's an opportunity for corrective action. And sometimes it results in penalties and an order that re does require corrective action. So does that help answer that question? Yes. Okay. In solid waste, we do have seven open enforcement cases against various properties, um, and we have seven NOVs. At this time, in 2018, we had eight complaints. We've had 30 so far this year. We had 59 complaints in 2018. Um, I know I've talked about the 54 um, sanitary communities that we're working with, 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 a, with a wet weather plan, plan for, for sewage collection system due to infiltration that's ongoing. One of the big things, again, is the Alcazan, um, that consent decree, again, there really is an update right now. It is still with the Department of Justice for their final approval. I know Mike is going to talk a little bit about those. I just want to caution everybody. That consent decree is, is, is confidential negotiations. Anything that's actually in that decree, we actually can't discuss. Right now, um, we think that the Department of Justice any day now could sign that, and it will be subject to a 60-day public comment period, and that would be a good opportunity for us to explain what this, this decree actually requires. Food safety, we have had 877 complaints so far this year. At this time last year, we had 1,003 consumer alert postings. Um, we've had six year to date. This time last year, we did have 10. However, for permit suspensions and closures, we've had 21 so far this year, year to date. We had nine um, at this time last year in 2018. Civil penalties, we've had five so far this year, and at this time last year, we had six. So those are, those are pretty much in line with the exception of permit suspensions and closures. For plumbing program, there's not much going on there. We've um, had 61 referral service requests, complaints. That's all some type of response action due to um, issues. Uh, we have 61 this year, 77 year to date in 2018. And we've issued 41 NOVs this, this so far year to date. Housing community environment, right now we've had 1,007 complaints year to date, which is up a little bit from 2018 where we had 894. Now for the air quality program, um, for complaints, so far this year we have had 5,701, 506 of those were through our typical means, whether you call in or assign those to the web, 
and we've had 5,195 through Smell Pittsburgh. There has been a marked increase due to the Claritin fire. Some of our open enforcement cases, we have a lot going on, but these are still just the big ones. Uh, Churchill Community Development, that's at the old Westinghouse facility, that was a $1.4 million fine for asbestos violations. It is still currently appealed to the Commonwealth Court. Sheraton Pittsburgh Airport Hotel, I don't know if I've discussed this much in the past, that is, it's on Thorn Run Road near the airport. Um, that's almost a $600,000 fine for various uh, managing entities and recovery operations because from, my, from a um, water event that caused uh, some response and demolition and, and uh, some work in a number of rooms as well as their conference rooms where they had to remove a lot of material and expose a lot of uh, asbestos. So that is also currently under appeal with a majority of those who are involved in that as well. McKees Rocks Industrial Enterprises, we finalized the order on March 25th. The order required new reporting requirements, visible emission limitations, operational requirements to reduce fuse emissions, and a $1,500 fine. The order has been appealed, but the interesting thing about that is they paid the penalty, but they're appealing a lot of the other a, a, a lot of the other actions that we're requiring for them. Um, I do want to state that McKees Rocks Industrial Enterprises has been one of the most proactive companies that we've ever dealt with in any enforcement activity. They, they have actually done a lot of additional things that we didn't even ask them to do, and they got on it right away. Metallico, Metallico is, this, is the, also on Eagle <coughs> Island. It's a waste recovery place, uh, scrap metal. The issue with that is a lot of visible emissions from burning, burning off plastics on some of the scrap metal, plus some explosions when they recover some of their gas tanks. There's been a lot of complaints about them, but we haven't had any recently. We did order, uh, we did order an issue an order for violations. The violations have been resolved. However, there have been was a recent video of visible emissions exceedance, and so we're working on that, and that could possibly lead to another order. For U.S. Steel. The 2016 consent order, it effectively, effectively ended in March 24th. The, the requirements of that order were for them to improve their visible missions as read by their stack monitors. Um, and so they have shown they have shown improvement with that and they issued their, their actually notice of compliance with that and shortly after March 24th. So that consent order is effectively closed. For the USDO Edgar Thompson plan, if you remember, we had a joint NOV that we entered in with EPA. Um, there still is no status. It was referred to the Department of Justice. I know we've had some meetings with them lately talking about penalties. However, EPA wants to go out and visit the facility early this summer to look and see if there's a number of correction actions that they were required to do to see if they are actually working on those corrective actions before they finalize any type of activity with that order. The 2018 enforcement order for the recurring violations that we had, um, the million dollar order plus the requirement to go into hot idle, they didn't show two consecutive quarters of improvement starting in 2019. I know in first quarter of 2019, they are meeting the requirements of that order. Um, if you will recall, there was the appeal hearing on December 3rd, the week of December 3rd. All the briefs have been filed and we are still awaiting a decision by the hearing officer. In addition, the second order, Quarter penalties, we issued a $600,000 order for that. And then the third and fourth penalty quarters, that was a $750,000 penalty. Those two orders have been consolidated. They have been appealed. And there is a hearing that's been set for September. For the Claritin Coke Works Fire, the desulfur station equipment requirements of the March 12th order, if you recall, they were supposed to bring the equipment up to 100% desulfurization by April 15th and start um, testing their equipment by April 1st. So they brought the equipment up by April 4th. Uh, U.S. Steel still must report their SO2 emissions, flow rates, and their H2S grain loading for all three facilities until June 30th because there are some additional repairs that need to be done to the equipment. Until, so they either report until June 30th or until all those repairs are completed. We are still collecting and evaluating all the emissions data necessary to calculate civil penalties. There are 102 days of penalties across three plants and multiple emission sources. This is a massive amount of data. And so we have to calculate it because we don't have monitors on the stacks. So we have to use their fuel usages and their grain loading to determine what the emissions are so we can use that as empirical evidence for determining what those fines are. However, and we're not done with that, we're still working on that. Um, there was a complaint issued by the National Environmental Law Center on Monday, 
And so that was a complaint that was issued, which is interesting because you can issue a complaint without having the empirical evidence of actually violations. So they can issue that complaint. One of the things ACHD is considering is we are considering of intervening with this complaint. What intervening means is actually we join with the complainants. What that means is then what happens is this takes it out of our administrative hearing process, it goes to federal court. And the purpose of that is, is ACHD wants to ensure that we do not in any way get in the way of a citizen suit to move forward. So and that's our current status for updates. I'll have a lot more information about the current status of air quality when I talk about the PM 2.5 uh, state implementation plan a little bit later. So does anyone have any questions? Thanks. You said that the, uh, the data from once the yeah. desulfurization came back on the yes. that data still be analyzed? Yes. Or what the so we have to calculate, so yeah, so <coughs> when we say, you know, you know there, there are certain things you know, with H2S grain loading that they've used. However, when they burn that, they have dozens of stack emissions that is burned in. And so we have to use that data to calculate what the emissions are at each one of those stacks. Because so all those stacks actually have emissions of <coughs> SO2. And so we're calculating that. We have these flow rates, fuel usage rates, the fact that they were using natural gas kind of complicates that. So it, it's quite a big order. So we can't finalize a penalty to say, we have empirical evidence. Say your emission rate is 10 pounds per hour. Well, we have to prove that it was over that 10 pounds per hour. So, there's, so we have to take this data and do a lot of calculations for fuel usage and, and mass flow rate balances. Do you have an estimate for the timeline for that? It, it's really hard to understand because right now we're trying to, we're even trying to assess if we have enough data right now. They've been working on it for quite a while. Um, we still, you know, it, it, it's, it's a complicated effort. So I, I really don't want to speculate on where that's going to be because I know um, our enforcement folks, you know, they're, they're really buried in that, and it's, it's a lot of data. It takes a lot of time to do that, that calculation. And it's got to be right. We can't make any mistakes, because anytime time you make a mistake with your emission experts, you know, that, that makes the challenge a lot simpler. We've got to take our time and make sure we do it right. Any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so, Live Well Allegheny and the Opioid grant. So I'm going to just do a quick overview of where we are with LiveWell. Um, we now have 64 communities, 18 school districts, and 167 community partners um, who joined, as well as 49 restaurants and 31 workplaces. Um, the newest community is Baldwin Township. Uh, the newest school district is South Allegheny School District, and the newest workplaces are CCAC, the Oncology Nursing Society, and For Good Pittsburgh, or For Good PGH, I'm not sure is that. Um, we have uh, been working on the REACH grant, which we received from the CDC. That's underway. That's a grant of over $700,000, specifically focused on food access. Um, rest, uh, food access, I'm trying to remember all the things, built environment and connections to clinical care. And it is particularly focused on the African American community um, who uh, are experiencing disparities. And so that's uh, <laughs> underway um, now as well. And there's a lot of partners who are working with us on that. Um, and I think the only other thing is that right now we are spending, uh, we have uh, hired two new positions to work specifically in the Mon Valley, focusing on Libwa Allegheny types of priorities, health education, things like that. Um, and we are moving towards um, developing and hoping to uh, figure out where we can find space for a Mon Valley district office likely to be in McKeesport. So that's where we are with that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about opioid grant, which we have just completed and submitted. Huh. That's always a relief. Yes, exactly. That's why I can talk about it now. All right, so um, the overdose... The Overdose uh, Data to Action Program. <coughs> Basically, we were informed. Sorry, we were informed about six weeks ago by the Centers for Disease Control that we um, could potentially receive a very large grant focused specifically on opioid uh, overdoses. This is unusual in that it's a non-competitive funding opportunity, meaning they've identified communities that have a. Um, very high rates of opioid overdose deaths and basically told them exactly how much money they could get. Uh, and so this is really to help us use data to inform our prevention and response efforts. 
This is a three-year grant that would start in September. It is for $5 million a year for three years. Yes, $5 million. Now, maybe some of you all here have written grants for $5 million. I will say personally, I never wrote a grant for this much money. That's a huge grant. It is a huge grant, especially given that it is non-competitive. $400,000 must be spent on surveillance, and over $4 million or $5 million must be spent on their definitions of prevention. Funds cannot be used for naloxone purchase, for drug take back, and I do want to just mention that our colleagues um, at Giant Eagle, thank you, Edie, uh, have just uh, instituted take back boxes in I think 10 of their stores. I was uh, privileged to be at their opening the other day of the one that's in um, Shadyside, and they're really great. They're these small little boxes, and you basically just go in there and put whatever drugs, including your veterinary supplies, uh, into the box. Um, you can't use it for purchasing fentanyl strips, and you cannot use it for direct treatment or research. This is just an overview of all the different types of things um, that they want us to be doing. Those that are required, obviously, we must do, but then we also chose to focus on public safety partnerships and empowering <coughs> individuals. These are all of our partners that are involved in this grant, and I want to thank all of them for getting us their budgets and their proposals in the time frame, which was extremely short. Um, but just to name them all, Prevention Points, Royal Health Health Center, the Department of uh, Health Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, Human Services, the Jail, the Office of the Medical Examiner, Bridge to the Mountain, UPMC Health Plan, Gateway Health Plan, UPMC Health Services, AHN Health Services, the Schools of Pharmacy at both Duquesne and Pittsburgh, the Poison Control Center, the City of Pittsburgh Police, and, <coughs> and uh, the adjoining communities that it represents. And the types of activities that we are proposing include expanding our surveillance. Many of the partners mentioned will be providing additional data to us expanding the use of the prescription drug monitoring program. We, are, um, we do know that there's been a fairly extensive decrease in the number of opioid prescriptions that have been written in our county. Uh, expanded case management and Lincolnshire care services outreach. We are planning, if accepted, to do a harm reduction and anti-stigma campaign. Academic detailing, both to the pharmacists as well as to prescribers throughout mul these multiple large systems. Um, we are working with the City of Pittsburgh Police to do pre-arrest and pre-trial diversion police activities. Similarly, Connect will do that as well with uh, about five communities that they've already identified. Um, the health plans are going to be looking at quality metrics for um, payment, for bundled payment rates to expand um, medication-assisted <laughs> treatment and obviously to continue work on alternatives to pain management. So a lot of work going on in this area. There are some other opportunities that have also presented themselves. Um, and uh, we are very hopeful that our proposal will be accepted and we will start this work in September. It also means we're going to have to find some space for people. <laughs> so. That's fabulous. Any questions? I have a question, sir. In prevention, how are you going to prevent when you're not uh, giving an axon? So we actually have a grant from SAMHSA, which is a Substance Abuse Mental Health Services um, uh, Administration, and we did get uh, a grant for naloxone from them. Um, I believe that the, the CDC, the feds have kind of split up where they're paying for things from. So the CDC is paying for these types of activities and SAMHSA is paying for naloxone. But our state has also got a line item specific to naloxone and we've been receiving money from them. We're the coordinating entity for the county. We've given out more than, I think, 8,000 doses already. And uh, my understanding is there's money in the governor's budget for the next year as well. So we're less concerned about getting more naloxone at this time. What about surveillance? What are the, what pay your doing surveillance in the various regions? Um, surveillance. 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 The surveillance. Surveillance. What yes. else are we going to be doing besides what we're doing? Yes. So right now we're using data from emergency room departments, uh, data from the emergency services use of naloxone. We have that. Obviously the medical examiner's office. We're going to be expanding it to get uh, information from the health systems on how much medication-assisted treatment they're actually providing. We're going to be getting data from the prescription drug monitoring program so that we can actually look at it by census tract. 
Uh, we are going to be getting um, data on urine tests from the jail so that we can figure out what new drugs might be coming into the system and expansion of uh, information coming out of the um, medical examiner's office. Um, because remember, not only do they do the autopsies, but they also do the crime lab and they get the data on what's actually in the confiscated drugs. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Caroline, did you join in? Yes, I have been here listening. Okay, thanks. So Caroline Mitchell is joining us, one of our Board of Health members. Uh, we're going to move to new business. Uh, Dr. Brink's going to give us an infectious diseases update. Thanks, Tom. So basically, this is a um, measles update given the current situation. I'm Louie Brink. I'm chief epidemiologist here at the County Health Department. So um, as you know, measles is a highly contagious acute viral disease characterized by a fever and maculopapular rash. Uh, complications in, in children can include pneumonia, encephalitis, and death. Pneumonia about uh, 1 in 20, encephalitis 1 in 1,000, and death in 1 to 2 per 1,000. The incubation period for the virus is between 7 and 21 days, and the infectious period begins four days prior to, and that should actually say rash onset, so it's uh, four days prior to that. Uh, nationally, there's been an outbreak uh, being tracked by the CDC since the first of this year. Um, and up until a few days ago, there have been 704 cases of measles reported. This is actually the highest number since 1994. And actually in uh, 2000, it was declared eradicated from the US. In 1994, there were 963 cases. So we are um, actually closing in on that already. Um, in the current outbreak, nationally, 71% of the cases were unvaccinated although 11% had received at least one dose of the MMR vaccine. 18% um, had an unknown vaccination status, 9% have been hospitalized, and 3% had pneumonia, although none, had, none, none died or had any encephalitis. I did want to mention that of the cases, of the um, 704 cases nationally, 44 were directly imported from other countries and 34 of those were U.S. residents traveling internationally who, who were not vaccinated. <clears throat> In this outbreak of the 704 cases nationally, the median age was five years. You can see that 4% were under six months, 10% uh, were between a half year and a year, 11% were 12 to 15 months, 24% were 16 months to four years, and then 29% uh, were also children, and only 4% were over 50 years of age. Um, of the countries visited, of the imported cases, that's where they had come from in varying numbers. So vaccine recommendations. Um, children 12 months or older should get two doses of the vaccine, the first between age 12 to 15 months, and the second dose before they enter school between four and six years. So you can see why there's a, a number of cases in a very young age group, because that age group is actually unvaccinated per recommendations. Adults without evidence of immunity should get at least one dose of MMR, and that is known to uh, bring about 93% immunity. Healthcare personnel, college students, and international travelers should have two doses, and that confers about 97% immunity. Uh, vaccine for international travel, at this point, infants age six to 11 months should have a dose of MMR. Uh, children 12 months of age or older should have the two doses, but those two doses need to be separated by 20, 28 days. So um, if they start between six and 11 months, and then after they turn a year old, they can have another dose. Uh, for this particular outbreak, um, and Allegheny County does not have an outbreak, although we do have a case. Um, a second dose should be considered for children aged one to four or for adults who only had one dose. And infants six to 11 months can be vaccinated. So vaccination coverage overall, I mean, in the U.S. we're doing pretty well. Uh, the, the rate is 94.7% in children entering kindergarten, but I think we're all aware that in some uh, smaller areas, 
those uh, those rates of vaccination are a little smaller, and that's enabled some of the um, that, that outbreak to propagate. Here in Allegheny County, our vaccination rate is 97.6 percent for the 2017-18 uh, school year among our kindergarten uh, entering uh, students. This is actually up from uh, just over 90% in 2011, and all this data is publicly available for every school in Allegheny County, um, what our vaccination rate is, and it's, it's on this website here, and you can Google it on our website. Do I have any more? Or is that it? Oh, sorry, so the case that uh, we did report yesterday afternoon, uh, this is the first case in Pennsylvania. <laughs> During this, uh, during this year. This uh, represents an Allegheny County resident who traveled internationally and returned to Pittsburgh two weeks before his rash onset. So you'll remember that the incubation period is between seven and 21 days. So this fits um, probably uh, imported. The resident was treated and discharged from UPMC Shadyside Emergency Room on Monday and is currently recovering at home and he's remaining at home. Uh, this individual was potentially contagious starting Thursday, April 25th, and exposures may have occurred at the following locations. And again, please note the, uh, the time frames here as well as the dates. Um, measles is highly contagious and it does hang in the air for up to two hours after the person leaves that environment, so that's why um, these times are very specific. So those were at the Giant Eagle Market District on Friday and Sunday, and at the Aldi um, on Bond Boulevard on Friday. Thank you. Any questions? And has the patients get immunity after the disease? Oh, um, so for individuals born be before 1957, um, they're considered to be immune because most likely they've had the disease. Yeah. That can be so. yeah, recurrent measles is, is very, very rare. So you typically get lifelong immunity after oh, okay. a natural infection. Yes. And one of the questions that regularly comes up is when you have a child that's between one years old and four years old or five years old, mm -hmm. and there is some measles in the environment, at what point is there enough contact to say that a second dose is required before the <coughs> immunization on entering school? I think we're not at that point in Allegheny County now, but is there some sort of guideline to say how much is enough to, that we have to start to be concerned? I, th I think that's when a, an outbreak is declared in that, in that locality, and we're certainly not at that point. Okay, and who would declare an outbreak? Well, we, well, our state, so, so as you know, we work really closely right. with both the CDC and with the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and we actually did have some conversations about this. We were mostly concerned around um, particularly people visiting other communities where there was a likelihood that they would be exposed, New York, New Jersey. And I know that some of the local children's hospital, I think, and the pediatricians were really considering doing earlier vaccination for children, <coughs> particularly at least the first dose, right? So instead of doing it at, uh, what is it, 18 months? I can't remember. 15, yeah. 15 months, thank you. They were doing it one year um, before they went out. As, as far as uh, the CDC has told us, there has not been that other recommendation. So we're just in constant contact with them to see if we would need the to do that. The reason I asked, I'm getting asked this same question. Yeah, so I, so we're, all getting lots of, we're all getting lots of questions. <laughs> right. <laughs> We, uh, we are going to be, you know, this is the first case in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is, we're surrounded. All the other states have basically reported cases. So um, we have to assume that we will likely have additional cases. And uh, at this point in time, you know, basically we're monitoring um, this particular case. Obviously, there may be additional people who come forward. There may be other cases that uh, we are then um, investigating. And we'll keep, we'll keep everyone informed on that. And there's this misconception that measles is always just a sort of a benign febrile rash illness, but as you pointed out, there's pneumonia, there's encephalitis, other neurologic complications, so it's a, it's a serious situation. And it's highly, I, I think the thing that's really, it's so highly contagious. I mean, I think of all the diseases, the infectious diseases that we deal with, measles is probably the most contagious in that you can literally be in a room two hours after the person has left and still potentially um, be infected. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, <coughs> Michael Parker is going to talk about that and some of the
Hey, well, hello, everyone. My name is Michael Parker. I'm the solicitor for the Health Department. And I'm here today to give you a brief update on the Alcasan Consent Decree modification process. Uh, Jim already shared some of those details with you earlier. Do the is there a clicker up here. Thank you. All right, so to begin with, I just want to give a quick overview of, uh, of the his history of this process. So the original consent decree uh, was entered by the, the federal courts in January of 2008. The process it took quite a few years before that to get to that point. Uh, the whole action was based on uh, Clean Water Act, Pennsylvania Clean, clean Stream Laws, and violations of our Article 14, which is our sewage uh, uh, management uh, provisions. Uh, and the, the reason this was all done is because at the time and, and ongoing, there's uh, approximately 9 billion gallons of untreated sewage and sewage contaminated stormwater that overflows per year. That's a, that's a large number. So the point of the original consent decree is designed to promote a uh, coordinated regional approach to uh, wet weather discharges from the Alcasan system. Uh, so it's required, it requires a submittal of a long-term uh, long uh, wet weather plan in coordination with the 83 Alcasan municipalities. Each of those municipalities also have legal requirements placed upon them uh, via this process. Uh, so the wet weather plan that they, they had to submit uh, was designed to ensure uh, uh, compliance with their NPDES permit. <laughs> NPDES stands for uh, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. It's the uh, uh, Clean Water uh, Act permit that's given to individual sources of uh, effluent. Uh, and the wet weather discharges uh, needed to be eliminated uh, under the plan. Uh, it also had a $1.2 uh, million civil penalty, and it had some uh, uh, stipulated penalties as well, and a $3 million uh, supplemental environmental project. And the milestones under the original consent decree extend from uh, 2012 to 2046. And uh, during that plan, Alcasan uh, selected uh, uh, an option to, to execute that plan, and that option um, uh, uh, was a $3.5 billion uh, cost. So the present modification process was initiated in 2013 when Alcasan requested an extension on some uh, consent decree uh, deadlines. And the reason for that uh, extension request was so that they could do flow reduction alternatives uh, studies. Uh, and those flow reduction alternatives uh, included green infrastructure. And some examples of green infrastructure uh, are included here. You see uh, uh, Kirby's payment, pavement, uh, subsurface infiltration beds, uh, dry wells and seepage pits, Vegetated roofs, rain gardens, uh, vegetated swells, and constructed wetlands are some of the examples. So we've been actively negotiating, the parties of the CD have been uh, actively negotiating uh, the modifications since 2013. And just as a reminder, the, the parties to this consent decree are uh, the EPA, uh, represented by the Department of Justice, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, uh, and the Allegheny County Health Department. So uh, years of negotiation, and we're, we're nearing the end of this. Uh, we do have a draft that has been completed. Uh, can't share with you the details of that draft. As Jim noted, it is still considered a confidential uh, settlement document. Uh, but we, th th there has been a completed draft, and it is currently under review by the agencies to, to, for final approval. Uh, once it has received that final approval, hopefully soon, uh, in the very near future, uh, it will be lodged with the Federal District Court here downtown. Uh, and once it's lodged, there will be a 60-day public comment period where everyone from the public uh, has an opportunity to review the plan and make any comments on, on, on its contents. So once, the, uh, once it's been lodged and the public uh, participation is completed after the 60-day public comment period, there would be a, a comment response document done by the federal government. And any changes might, that might be made as a result of the, the comments would, would occur during this time. Uh, once all that is done, uh, it's presented to the court, and the court approves it and is entered as a, as a final enforceable document. 
And that's really all I can talk about at this moment in time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, would, I would entertain questions, but I probably won't be able to ask them. So. <laughs> I, I have a couple of questions. Um, you know about process. Um, you can talk about the, the content. Um, one is about the six day home commentary. So that's fine by the federal government. Yes, that's required by federal laws. Will, will, will the health department be doing anything like Notice to let people know that. Oh, absolutely. We will, we, will, we will send out a press statement uh, letting everyone know when that process will be issued. Okay. And then the other question I had was, and I don't know if you can comment on that, you mentioned the parties who were involved, if you could talk about the types of expertise that go into the process. Sure. Each, each of the agencies uh, that were at the table brought their own engineers and their own attorneys who are versed in environmental law. And, and uh, the necessary environmental engineering. Uh, that, that included engineers from the KADP, engineers from the health department, and engineers from, from the federal government at the EPA. Other questions? Okay, Mr. Kelly is up for uh, several items. Yeah, because that was Jimmy. Jimmy, you want to back there? Yeah, please. I'm, I'm going to stand over here to give this presentation so I can see what everybody else is seeing. Um, <coughs> We get lights dimmed. Yeah, I ask everybody to get comfortable because this is long, <laughs> it's dense, and it's exceptionally boring. So this is really popcorn. This is really important, though. So I'm going to give a presentation. The purpose of the presentation is to give an overview of the state implementation plan. And the result of this is we're asking the board to allow us to go to public comment with this to satisfy our public participation process by the EPA and by the county for this SIP. Um, there's a lot of information here, and I do ask the board, if you have any questions during the time, please ask for on that, um, on that slide. So that'd be really helpful so I don't have to put back and forth because this is a long one. Um, this was presented previously. I'm not going to go over everything in this. I am just going to hit all the high points. <coughs> okay, first, you know, a state implementation plan it is a really broad thing. This is actually a revision to our state implementation plan. As an air program, we have a set of rules, we have programs, we've adopted certain parts of the Clean Air Act, and the Clean Air Act requires us to submit all of that to EPA so they can approve it in the Federal Register so everything can be federally enforceable. So the purpose of this is, is we have, in 2012, the National Air Quality Standards were revised for a fine particulate matter. And there are two standards. There was an annual basis, 12.0, and then there was a 24-hour basis. And then when EPA, when EPA changes those standards, we have to look at our data and see if we're complying with those standards. Well, we had um, enough data in the Mon Valley that EPA designated the entire county as non-attainment with these standards. When you're out of attainment, you have to submit a plan to EPA that shows how you're coming back into attainment. And again, all of the monitors, we have nine monitoring sites in Allegheny County, only the Liberty Monitor is currently not attaining this standard. The summary of the SIP, so the, the basically the SIP. Also I want to explain, this SIP is different than the SO2 SIP. The SO2 SIP, the SO2 is a localized component. And so you use a model kind of called a dispersion model to determine that. You can run a dispersion model on your laptop. Our SIP took a long time because EPA's model that they gave us didn't work for Allegheny County. So we had to hire a consultant to make changes to that model. And the, the, the amazing part about that is that work actually moved the needle for science. It, it actually allowed procedures to be done that other agencies can now use to make it easier for them to show compliance. So that SO2 portion was for the localized issues that we have in Allegheny County, the, the terrain, the meteorology, and then the type of emissions that come from a Coke oven that don't come out of stacks that are difficult to model. We needed that to characterize the PM as well as the SO2 emissions from the facilities so we can put into the PM SIP. Now the PM SIP uses a different model, it's a photochemical model that takes into consideration emissions from all over the country. It's a massive model. When I worked for Georgia, we had four PhD scientists who worked for three years with terabytes of computing power to put together one of these models. That's why we had to hire a consultant to do this. It's a monumental effort. So what you do, basis of the SIP, is like it looks at the base year of 2012, looks at the emissions then, and then you have to calculate emission reductions to 21, and you have to show that there's a reduction. That's, it's, that's a simplified way of looking at it. So we have to look at controls in place, things that have happened during that situation. Um, and also, 
EPA will look at the current trend in air quality. I want to note here at the bottom that, like we said before, 2018 was a particularly clean year. Um, I'll go ahead and go to these. I go go to the uh, presentation here for these slides. And so the annual weight mean from 2018, from 20 to 2018. Basically, what these points are, these are each of the monitors now getting counted. The top, the top um, line is what you want to look at. And so that is what's called our design value monitor. That's the worst reading monitor in Allegheny County. That is the Liberty monitor. So it shows how it's been trending. This is the year to year data. And so to show compliance with EPA, it's a three year value, but it shows right here in 2018, we had the cleanest year on record for, for PM 2.5. What does that mean in terms of compliance? Well, this is what compliance means. You have to do three year averages. And so currently we're still not complying with that annual number. Remember the annual number is 12 but we have shown improvement. Again, this is what is so is really important. 2018 was a very clean year, that last data point. It was 11.5 is the lowest we've ever had. Um, a lot of things that go into, go into that. Uh, meteorology has an influence. We had a lot of rainfall during the course of the year, but we don't think the rainfall had as a significant effect. It does have somewhat of a mitigating effect. It doesn't have a significant effect. Um, it wasn't a particularly bad year for inversions, but the important thing to note for this is Typically, our worst air quality is during the fourth quarter. The fourth quarter is where we have the type of weather conditions and inversions that actually lead to violations. So we can have a pretty clean year, fourth quarter happens, then we're out for the year. But also interesting to note is the Claritin facility had the fewest violations at their Claritin plant since 2015. And so there was a significant reduction in um, uh, compliance issues at the Claritin plant. And so all this, all this, uh, you know, goes together to show that we had a particularly clean year in 2018. Again, back to this shows that the three-year value shows that we're still above EPA standard. Okay, this is the 24-hour. This is the short-term exposure to PM. Again, the top line. All these are different monitors throughout. You'll see all these other monitors are trending well below. You also see that these monitors, well, are um, they're meeting the standard, but that top monitor is now currently, well, it's meeting the standard here. So. So we had a very clean year for the 24 hour values. It brought our average down to the standard. It is at 35, meaning the standard is 35. That is what EPA requires. Now this is really important to notice when you say meeting the standard. Anybody who's familiar with the purpose of a SIP, the Cleaner Act is very clear, the case law is very clear. You meet the standard, you have zero authority to go beyond that. So if you want to, you want to improve air beyond the SIP, you can't do it with a SIP because this is one of the most litigated parts of the Clean Air Act. It has been proven over and over again. You cannot have any requirements to reduce emissions beyond that red line. And so it's very frustrating as an air pollution control agency because we can't even include a buffer there. We just have to show that we can come down to the line and we can't go beyond that. If we go beyond that, the SIP is easily appealed and it is easily thrown out. So the SIP elements, there's a lot that goes on here. Obviously a control strategy, how do we reduce emissions? Emissions inventory, emission inventory and modeling demonstrations. That's what takes years to do. Um, previously, all SIPs in this country, ozone and PM SIPs, under statute, you were given three years to, do, to put together a SIP. No one's ever done a SIP in less than three years. Um, PM 2.5 SIPs were done in three years because it's a photochemical model. You have to do, you don't need, you know, the model itself is difficult. The emissions inventories can take two years or more to put together because of the cooperation. You have to have local emissions, state emissions, all the other state emissions, regional emissions, and they all have to be in the same format. And so you can spend almost two years fighting among all these other agencies, how you sync up your emissions. And I'll show you why that is important in a few slides from now. And so putting together those emissions inventories um, is a big part of it because we have emissions data for everything, including your own homes, your hot water heaters have emissions, your lawnmowers, all of the, you know, your equipment, blowers, they all have emission factors that we all have to put into this to determine what is the impact of emissions. The modeling demonstration, like I said, again, it takes a massive amount of computing power to do that. Then you have requirements that the Clean Air Act says you have to determine what is reasonably available to achieve. That's a really low bar. Basically, if you have a, if you have a stack with a bag house, you're already meeting that requirement, so you can't go beyond that because that's reasonable. Uh, reasonable further progress, that, that's, a, that's a thing that, that shows that during the course of that 2011, like I showed before, to the 2021, that you're on track to meet that requirement. Contingency measures is what you have to include if your SIP fails to meet 
attainment by that date, you have to you have a schedule to enact these measures that will reduce emissions even farther. Transportation conformity is one of those archaic rules in the country. And so a lot of people don't realize this. Any transportation project that happens in the area that's determined non-attainment has to go into a model and they have to determine whether or not if that any of those road construction processes or any types of anything involving transportation. Again, it's not the car emissions. The car emissions are part of the emissions inventory. It's just those projects that are associated with building roads and then the resulting traffic from those roads goes into conformity. And conformity just means that if they build a new interstate, that interstate can't appear with the ability of the area to meet that national ambient air quality standard. Non-attainment new source review means if you have a big source of emissions in a, in a, in a non-attainment area, it has to go through a, a heavy level of permit review and you have to get emissions offset if you have any type of increase in emissions. Then weight of evidence is everything else if you don't have really empirical evidence. We have, might have some programs, some fireplace changes out. We don't, have, we don't have actual missions for those, but they show that we have a lot of these programs that go beyond what is required by any type of regulations. So these, these SIPs are big, right here, appendices, 60 megabytes, 1,300 pages in the appendices alone. Most of you, if you would look at the SIP, you're just going to look at the narrative. The narrative may be 50 or 60 pages long. It's a summary of all that. The appendices is where all the science happens. It is huge, it is heavy, and again, this is really dense stuff. Um, and so here's the control strategy in the SIP. Remember when I told you, the SIP cannot go beyond the standard because that is, that is, that is solid. I mean, there's case law, it is statute, and it's regulatory requirement. And I know it is frustrating, but that's, that's the reality. If you want to go beyond that standard, you've got to find other measures, and that's what the health department is working on. So, and, the, and here's what happens. So any, any emission controls or reductions that's happened since 2011 goes into that SIP to show improvement toward that 2021 attainment date. So US Steel has had new low emission quench towers, Cheswick, um, that is our power plant. So they put on flue, flue gas desulfurization. That's really important because for SO2 is not directly related to PM 2.5. It is one of the biggest contributors for a regional area because in some parts of the country, 60% of all your PM comes from SO2 that forms with ammonia and actually forms particulate matter secondarily in the atmosphere. So our, a lot of our regional input is from like Ohio, all, all these power plants they have, all that SO2 going in the air, it's gonna form secondary particulate matter and it's gonna give us our base layer of PM. Sometimes you look at that, what is the base six to eight micrograms below that 12 is your regional component. That comes from a lot from um, SO2 from power plants. Then Allegheny Ludlam, Common Twirly, all these plants have all had <clears> new uh, equipment put on at the time, as well as we've had facilities who have shut down. Those are very significant. Shenango Guardian, GE Bridgeville, which is their, their lead glass plant, which also re, um, removed our requirement to actually monitor lead for that area because they were the only lead source. So when you look at source sectors, these are the things that we have to look at for control. Stationary sources, you're all familiar with. That's in industry. <clears throat> area sources. This is really difficult. Combustion, wood burning solvents, railroad, marine, gas stations, even um, uh, minor sources like um, dry cleaning. Those are all things that we have emission factors for. Mobile sources, this is a really difficult part right here. Non-road non um, and on-road. On-road is, we don't have really good data in the Pittsburgh area like some of your larger metropolitan areas where they have a transportation demand model that they can look at the registration, they can, and they have good DOT counts for your whole area, and so they can have really good data. Pittsburgh is a little smaller, so it's difficult to do that, to determine that total contribution from, from mobile sources, but it is good enough by EPA standards. Non-road is very difficult. Non-road typically does not have good re regulations, and one of the things that's um, um, difficult here is that, they're, they're, again, they're not registered, so we don't know how many of them are there, and so you have to, rely on emission factors to determine what that what that equipment out there. And fire and biogenics, so these are natural sources of PM 2.5. These are really important because open burning, if you're some parts of the country like um, the Southeast United States, they do, they do, like Georgia would do, two million acres of preventative burns a year. They're called um, prescriptive fires. That's how they have to manage their forests because those forests don't exist. They don't reproduce unless they have fires. And so that's a big part. Here we have a lot of localized burning, bonfires, different things like that. Uh, biogenics is a little bit different. A lot of people don't realize that your trees, especially pine trees and oak trees, they have a, a huge contribution to VOC in the area. 
And that VOC is one of those things that eventually can be a secondary uh, component to forming PM 2.5. So these are the emission inventories, these are the numbers. It gives you an idea. They show the shows the reductions during the course of the SIP. The import, you know, the PM2.5 is what you want to pay it most close attention to, the SO2 and the NOx. SO2 and NOx is a big chunk of that secondary formation I was talking about as well. You'll see those are huge reductions from the top totals to the bottom totals. And so this shows you the emission reduction during that area. So Here's, here's a good map that shows the, the big sources of emissions. The pie chart shows you where everything's coming from. Stationary point sources, again, those industrial sources. On-road mobile, you see how big it is. Um, um, it, you know, especially, for, it, it's even more important for ozone where the majority of your VOC and NOx emissions actually come from your on-road mobile sources and your area sources on-road fire and biogenics. This shows you, you know, the total composition of where all your particulate matter in Allegheny County is coming from. I'm not going to get into modeling. I think we've already talked about that, but it's important to note this is a photochemical grid model. It is a massive lift, and it takes a couple years once you get the information in there to put it, to tweak it, and to run all these iterations of all these control scenarios before you get to the final result. And again, the purpose of the SIP, you look at the base year, you project it to 21, 21. And part of that projection is we actually have meteorology that we look at the emissions and the meteorology for 2021. And we'll repeat that again in 2021 with the new emissions. So this is what this is this one thing I want you to take a look at. So this is why PM SIPs are so difficult because PM is a region emission because I told you there's a lot of that secondary formation. So you see these domains. We have our small tiny one there for Allegheny County. Then we have our regional one. Then we have our extra regional. All of the emissions that happen in these areas have to sync. They have to be in the same format to get them to work with the model. So this means we have to work with other states, we have to work with other state modeling agencies, and so that is a lot of cooperation, it's a lot of lead time to, to get to the information just to put into this SIP. That's one of the things that makes it so complicated because this goes beyond just Allegheny County Health Department. You know, there's a, there's a lot of other things in play here. So, and here's something, this may not mean a lot, so this is a grid. So we have emissions data. The model runs simulations. They run these thousands and thousands of, of simulations for photochemistry, the chemistry of the, all, all of the pollutant reacting in the atmosphere and all these little things. So this domain is 1.33 kilometers. A typical SIP will use a 12-kilometer domain. And so that shows you because we have such complex um, terrain and so difficult uh, the processes and the facilities that we have, like Flareton, because they're difficult, we have to go to a much smaller domain. Because of that, it makes the modeling infinitely harder and longer to do, because if you look at any other state SIP, it's going to be 12 kilometers or more. Sometimes they may go down for four. We do our whole domain in 1.33 kilometers, and that is tiny, and that's big. So and again, I, I want to remind you, so all of that modeling that we did and how we moved the science for the SO2 <coughs> SIP, we had to take that, the model that we use is CAMEX, which is, is different than CMAC, which that means nothing to you, but one of those models allows a localized influence to be plugged in, it can be nested inside that model. So when you do that with CAMEX, we can take our dispersion model and insert that in there so we can have those really good representations of the emissions from the Mon Valley that plugs into that model. And that, that's really complicated to do that. And all this work that our modeling folks did um, in the planning organization, you know, how they, they got EPA to accept that new method. That is really important because it really improves the ability of this model to forecast and represent emissions. These are receptors. What a receptor is is where the, basically a receptor is where the, the monitor is. So the model has to run a simulation and it has to agree, like we're gonna take 2011, we have, data from the monitor, and then we're going to run the model, and the model has to agree fairly well with that receptor to determine if the model works, and then we take that and we project it to the future. So this is the bottom line. If this is Once all that modeling is done, everything else, this is the bottom line. This is what EPA looks at to determine compliance. These are all of our monitors, so that design value, remember the design value is a three-year average. All it needs to show is the future design value is going to be 12 or less for the annual standard or 35 or less for the 24-hour standard. Unfortunately, we're right at 12, we're right at 35. 
Also, unfortunately, again, case law, the Clean Air Act, it all determines we have zero authority to go beyond that. But this, does, this is what it takes to show attainment. I know this is a number is exercise, it's a little frustrating, but this is the reality of, of SIPs. Um, I already talked a little bit about this. Anything, and these are reasonable measures for, for controls. Reasonable is a pretty low bar. Basically, if you have any type of control whatsoever, it's gonna, it's gonna be a meter regional, uh, a reasonable issue. Reasonable for the progress, make sure that during the course of that 2011, 21, you're making emission reductions each year. EPA has uh, milestones for that that you have to meet. Again, contingency measures like I talked about before. If we do not, if by the end of 2021, those model monitors, like the Liberty Monitor doesn't show attainment with that, then we need to be able to quickly install these other reduction requirements. Right now, our general measures enhance wood burning curtailment program and additional enforcement actions. Again, transportation conformity, I've already talked about this, and, and, and uh, weight of evidence of those other things that we do that aren't part of the empirical evidence that show emission reductions. Not attainment, new source review. Again, these are all things that we have to check off, all, the, all, these, all these requirements, transportation conformity, contingency measure. These are things that the SIP has to show that we have a response for all of these things. Um, we came before this board a few months ago. We requested you to vote on the non-attainment new source review. Remember, I asked you that this is a requirement. It has to be done before EPA will approve this SIP. And here's the schedule right now. Um, we're going to the Board of Health, and we're going to ask the board today to allow this to go to public comment. Then we're going. This is the rest of the schedule. The important thing to note is that EPA has a deadline of November 7th to, for us to submit this to EPA. So this shows that we're ahead of EPA. And because this is a state implementation plan, we do have to submit to the state, and then the state will submit that to EPA. So you can wake up now if you have any questions. <laughs> uh, one question. <clears throat> yes. Excellent presentation, but some of us could not <laughs> understand. <laughs> Sorry. This, uh, the pollution from other areas like Ohio, West Virginia coming into the yeah. our county. What are the measures we are going to take, and is there any control over it from our side? So we, we can't control measures coming in from the other states. I mean, we we can give a good we can give a good representation of what they are. But what EPA does for PM and for ozone both, they have transportation <coughs> transport regulations that will reduce the emissions typically from power plants. And so that EPA helps us with that. They're usually behind, you know, they're usually about five years behind, but they do that. So they have uh, averaging plans and emission requirements for, for power plants. And then like if you're in the Northeastern region, we have what's called the NOx SIP call, all big sources of NOx, which is a big part of ozone, which is also a big part of TM. And there are regulations that go beyond power plants for our area. And so, so as far as the transport, that's what. Now there is the 126 provision of the Clean Air Act that you can sue upwind states, but that. we're not a state. The state would have to do that, like emissions from power plants in Ohio. If the state of Pennsylvania found out that those emissions were interfering with Pennsylvania's ability to meet these NACs, then they could sue that upwind state. Um, Why so, couldn't we be part of the state? Because I don't think, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I don't think we have standing because again, it's the Clean Air Act is very clear about states versus local areas. And so we probably could, um, you know, we could probably intervene to some point but to, to, we, to provide that information to demonstrate. We, we did participate in, this, yep. uh, in action in Ohio before my time here, um, but I can't remember how that mm -hmm. transpired. I, I know right now there's a big issue with, between New York State and Maryland where they are petitioning EPA to enforce ozone provisions in upwind states through the 126 provision and EPA stalling them on that. So you're gonna see a lot of litigation on that in the future. So. Have we ever been sued for East states from us? No, we have we don't have enough emissions to make a difference, you know. Do you Thank uh, you. Oh, sorry, on that on that line, do you have a sense for you mentioned before how much of the, the burden of pollution that we're seeing in our monitors is because of those out of state sources? So outside of the the Mon Valley um, you know, the, the North Braddock Monitor and the Liberty <coughs> Monitor, we have a big localized local contribution. And that's kind of unusual because anytime you're over a microgram or two, it's huge. And we're over three at Liberty and probably about a microgram and a half or so 
um, it, it Braddock, and that's primary PM localized. But outside of that, I couldn't tell you for sure without talking to our, our modelers, but it, it's, again, there's that regional component and all those secondary reactions because it's coming from West Virginia, it's coming from Ohio, it's coming from before Ohio. So as far as that contribution, you know, again, background, you can argue is between six and eight. And, you know, that's from everything that comes from everywhere else. And so that's probably the best answer I can give you with that without, you know, getting, digging into the modeler model and actually looking at the sensitivity. There are ways you can zero things out and find what the sensitivities are. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Burke. Um, could, could you remind me how the original decision about the location of the monitors, how that came about, why the Liberty Monitor was put where it is, just uh, you know, okay. what's the history, or how, you know, because obviously yeah. that the readings will be a function yes. of the local. It uh, is. Um, now I was, I'm not the best person to do that. So typically our the monitors have, EPA has very specific criteria where the monitor has to be. Liberty is a little bit different because it is because EPA's criteria is to you have to locate a monitor to protect public health in, in a certain area and they have population requirements and siting requirements and typically for like PM you're not supposed to site a monitor that is overwhelmed by the localized source however in the past Allegheny County has chosen to do that at Liberty anywhere else in the country you probably wouldn't see that so typically you will follow EPA's modeling criteria like because I know it, it mon monitor locations, it's political football. And so, because hmm. because I've seen it before, where you have a monitor that's that you're having problems with, and it's, say it's located on a school, suddenly that school is closed. And you have to move the monitor. And so, you know, that's we don't do that here in Allegheny County, so we're, we're very lucky. We keep the monitors where they are to measure the pollution. So I, don't, I wasn't part of that process to, to locate that monitor there, but you know, EPA does have criteria, and this does fall outside of that criteria. I would be curious if it would be possible to find the documents about yeah, that, yeah. and yeah, uh, to, just for my own edification about the process of the decision making about the localization of that. Um, I have a second question, and that is uh, uh, that there are, as you mentioned, there are, are different types of PM 2.5, different <coughs> species that, uh, and uh, could you say a little bit more about the distribution of the different species of PM 2.5 in the county about are there certain areas that have a certain type of PM 2.5 and other areas that have a higher concentration of others and is there a significance to that in terms of health effects? Absolutely. So um, and I went back here and this isn't terribly helpful. So I know in the Mon Valley you have an extraordinary amount of primary PM. That is PM that's emitted right out of the stack because that's, that stuff falls out fairly quickly. And so, and the issue with a lot of facilities in Mont Valley, there's a lot of fugitive, there's a lot of low to the ground and short stacks. And so that, that makes it an issue. And so we have that phenomenon there. Um, and then downtown. And so when you're in your urbanized areas, a lot of your PM overwhelmingly comes from diesel exhaust. So you have that. And diesel exhaust is particularly um, problematic because it, diesel exhaust itself is considered a toxic. So just like cocoa and gas is considered a toxin. So when you get out of these urbanized areas and when you're in these rural areas, your your speciation is going to look very similar. You know, you're going to see a certain amount of that SO2, that's what sulfate that has come from way downwind. Then you're going to have a certain part of nitrate that also came from way downwind from um, power plants as well. And then you're going to have a component of open burning. Our open burning, our fire and biogenics, again, remember that that's that's slice of the pie right there it's only seven percent and so and that includes that you know that the biogenic version component you know the VOCs and everything that comes from trees and stuff that contributes as well as well as fires and that's not very much so there's a there's a monitor in, a, in a Columbus Georgia located near Fort Benning Fort Benning has a giant they have, they have a this longleaf pine plantation there and longleaf has to propagate through fires and the, so they have to burn that and have to maintain it. Sixty percent of all the PM in Columbus will probably come from burning. So, I, so that shows you how, from region to region, right. your local impacts can can affect that. But again, down urban areas, diesel, Mon Valley, industrial, and then everything else is going to be that regional component. So, so but the, no PM two point five is good. But are there some types that are worse than others? Yes, and, and the diesel component is a significant part of that. So is there some way of 
figuring that into health impacts or, or not, or we count it all the same? Well, the problem with the SIP, it doesn't, you know, you don't, you know, that's not the appropriate way to do that. I mean, I, to me, you know, I, I've tried to do that in the past, not here, but in the past, because it is important because, again, that PM 2.5, that is a very effective particle that can get all the way across and into your bloodstream. And so, and it can carry a lot of different things. If it's diesel, it's carrying a lot of toxics on it with it. But you're in an industrial area, you can have a little bit of metals and other toxics as well. And so, it, and I know there have been studies shown that rural areas, rural PM versus urban PM, there, there's a significant difference in the toxics associated with as well as industrial areas. And it's a really good question. The only problem is, is the SIP is not, is, you know, again, a SIP is very administrative. You know, it's just numbers. You need to reduce emissions, get to the number. And so, but that, that's a really good point. And I think for the future of air, of air quality, I think that's something that needs to be recognized because not all PMs create the same. Right. Mm -hmm. If I could just add briefly to that, and thank you, by the way, for this. This is an I know this is an enormous amount of work that goes into producing this. And this was a very thorough presentation. I did not fall asleep once. Um, <laughs> but if I could add on to that, I think that um, it is very important, and as you said, increasingly important that we do figure out how to connect um, these numbers of you know sources and emissions and how that translates into actual health impacts. Mm -hmm. Um, because unlike with an infectious disease uh, situation, you know, the, that, the health impacts of that are, are obvious and present. But here there's a little more translation and work to do to think about the impact on the population. I do think that's important. Yeah, not I, through the SIP process. Yeah, yeah and, and the SIP process is not, not built for that. For that. I mean, but there's a lot of other considerations with PM because right now is 24 hours appropriate because we have these spikes during inversions in the morning. People are suffering. They're going to the hospital because mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. asthma. But again, and then when it comes back down, well, over the course of the day, it's going to average out, and that's not showing an impact. And so I know the science is looking at that short-term impact of PM where people are suffering. One of the reasons it's particularly relevant is, is there's more evidence now that not all asthma is the same, yes. too, that there are major phenotypes of asthma, mm -hmm. some of which have different pathogenesis and others have different. And so the question is, are there two different things going on at the same time? And What's being caused, and are they have do they have different types of causes? Or not? Any other questions? Thanks. Okay, Jim, you've got some. No, we need to vote. I'm oh, sorry. Yes, we need to vote on uh, public comment. Yes. So can I have a motion, please? I motion to approve public comment. Second. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Thank you. All right, the sulfur and fuel issue. Okay. Okay, yeah. Thanks. All right, so after that, this is easy. Um, so the sulfur and fuel regulation, right now, we are, we are proposing a sulfur rule. We're, we're basically, we're taking the sulfur limits for fuel from 500 down to 15 for most cases. And this is fuel, this is industrial fuel. Um, this is fuel that's used in burners and industrial equipment. This is not for, for on the road use. The reason we're doing this is the state is moving toward this exact language. The state is not there yet, but they wanted to make sure that when they promulgate their rule, that ours is there so we can be the same. And so basically we're mirroring the, mirroring the state, but we are ahead of the state in this case. Now this is different than the RVP rule because the RVP rule was removing a rule that, that required a huge demonstration that removing that rule doesn't interfere with being able to attain. And so. So we didn't have to wait for that analysis to be handed off to us with EPA. And so this is completely different. This is making something more stringent so we don't have to go through that whole process like the RVP rule. So what we're asking, we're asking a vote to go to public comment for this rule that reduces the sulfur content of industrial fuels. Now, one of the things I want to note is the promulgation date in this. There's an editor's note in the, in the rule language here. That promulgation date will be what the whole idea is to coincide when the state promulgates their rule, ours will become effective at the same time. That way there are no two different standards across the state for industrial fuel, despite the fact that Philadelphia County has just currently done that and they've gone ahead. So we're asking for a vote to go ahead and do a public comment with this vote. Questions or comments? Have a motion? So, so move. <coughs> Second. Second. Any additional discussion? While I choke here. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? <clears throat> Okay, Jim, you're still up for a couple of um, fun requests. Okay, so our first up is the Clean Air Fund request. This is for $150,000 for air quality improvements, um, hopefully in increments of up to $30,000. We did this similarly last year. When we did this, we went through a contracting process. Well, we're learning a lot about that. We're trying to, to uh, streamline this. So we're requesting a vote to allow us to spend $150,000 on, on Clean Air Fund requests for pollution improvement projects. What did we do last year? Same amount? So last year, um, yes, yeah, $150,000 last year when we approved the projects for um, electrified bicycles and tree projects. Those were the two? No, there, there were a couple of tree projects, and there was, a, there was actually a fourth one I don't recall as well. So. <coughs> How do we measure something like that? Well, the, 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 in, the, in the scaling, there's there's requirement for emission reductions, and so I know tree projects are difficult to do that. But they're actually NASA actually has values for that is, is, is improvements. So the trees trees are really important because they actually have a surfactant property, um, especially near roadways. You know, they they have the ability to um, coagulate a lot of different particulate matter, well as as NOx and um, CO emissions in, in that area. And so they have a, a pretty mitigating effect. As well as noise. Any other questions or comments? If not, I have a motion. So moved. Second. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? Okay. So our last request is from the, a food safety fund request. Um, this is the purpose of the food safety fund is for training and for the purposes of, of improving food safety. We're asking $2,000 for two individuals to be trained over four days in current national food safety applications. So again, the food safety fund is made up from any type of inspection fees, consent orders, or civil activity associated with um, the food program. I have a question because yes. I think this came up the last time there was a request for this, possibly at our last meeting. Um, so, I, my question isn't actually about the specific request, but just in general about this fund because we don't hear about it a lot. Um, do we have it? We just started, the, yeah. But what's the status of this fund? So, I believe. Um, I yeah, it's a few hundred thousand. Yeah, we did. I think we sent it out after the meeting last time. We, okay. did, we did send it out. So. Okay. And it's, it's one of those funds that was created we didn't use for a while, and it's purposely for the training and advancement for the food. And then, so we're starting to use that for our training. So, is this for new hires? Or, is this for new hires? Is this for the new hires? The two people to be trained. This is for citizen people. Okay, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, director's report and announcements, anything? No. Oh. We've done it. Okay. Move into our okay, so we're moving speakers. into our um, public comment on non agenda items. I'd like to remind, we have 20 speakers. I'd like to remind folks uh, please hold to the three minute uh, limit. Our first speaker is Dave Smith. Clean Air Council about Claire and Coke work. Thank you. <coughs> so the book by Judith Forrest, Necessary Losses, talks about things that happen because of our age in our life and in the process of dying. Uh, it's a powerful book. I've heard her speak. Uh, she's incredible. But uh, she's talking about necessary losses. I think there are a lot of unnecessary losses that we have observed in the last two years in Clarendon. We've been doing videos, uh, three of four of us, uh, called The Legacy of Our Losses, where we're talking with people about their experience. Uh, Demetria Gideon, Gideon uh, Nancy Bernstein, and, and Miracle uh, Jones have been a key part of that. You might ask why it's taken so long to get 50 videos. I'll tell you. One, there's a massive amount of illnesses going on, and so people, when you call them, will say, we can't do it now, we're at the doctor's office, have to go to the doctor's this afternoon. Or we're heading to get chemotherapy. Or we need to uh, reschedule because my 
mate is sick or because there's a funeral I have to attend to, one of my cousins or my brother or my aunt. Uh, because, uh, you know, then there's the interview itself where we have to pause for people who suffer with coughing jacks or have to sit down or have to take medication or have to or share a plethora of pills, bottles of pills in front of them. Uh, then there's those, that, the one person that had scarcidosis that just literally put out about 15 bottles of pills in front of me. Then there's the funerals that just are amazing. I served as a minister for 16 years and I've never seen as many funerals or as deaths as there are taking place in Clarendon. Uh, many of the people have had lots of concerns for a long, a long time and it's bigger than the fire. It goes back decades as uh, we have said before. Cancer is rampant. Uh, at least two or three people we've talked to have said you know, this is my third round with cancer. Respiratory problems, COPD, emphysema, we talk about other losses, jobs, banks not being there, grocery stores, family members are no longer <coughs> coming to the table to, for dinner or for meals because they're gone. Friends that are sick and dying. They've buried a lot of people, about three to five funerals a year, and there's a lot of post-traumatic stress from my experiences. So there, so there are many unnecessary losses. Uh, we want to thank the health department for stepping up and for doing what you have done to take steps to alleviate this. But we'd like for you to see the faces of people that are, we have been talking with and to recognize them and acknowledge them and to see the human element in this and begin to address this uh, in a stronger manner. Uh, Please finish up. Our uh, county executive said this week or last Friday that there are a lot of things going on at Clarendon Coke works and we have a lot of work to do. We do, but we need it done now and expeditiously. So thank you for your time. Thank you. We have several other speakers. Uh, Mirable Jones also on Clarendon Coke Works. Hi, may it please the board. My name is Miracle Jones. I'm a JD MSW candidate at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, for the past few months, I've been able to work with the AFIL legacy of our losses. Um, I started out going to Claritin, going door to door, talking to people about what they were experiencing. And it's been very, very hard to deal with people who literally said they don't know if they need to leave to breathe or stay to remain in the connections with family and friends. What's been a common theme is that their love and support for the city of Clariton, their affinity for the mill, their fathers, their grandfathers, their friends, everyone that they've known their high, in their high school lives have worked um, at the mill and they've grown up with pollution. They've grown up knowing that there is a problem to breathe. They don't know what a life looks like if they still cannot grieve day in and day out. They tell their children, you can't go play with your next door neighbor um, because there's a breathing advisory. And they don't know sometimes until they wake up in the middle of the day and they're coughing, they can't breathe. There's a smell, it's an odor that is just so foul that they're closing their, their blinds, their windows, and they're turning off their fans. This is a real situation that people are dealing with and they're just asking for clean air. They're asking for a chance to be able to have the same um, futures for their children and their grand for their children and their grandchildren. And so to follow up with Dave saying, please, please hear these people in Clariton, please look at their faces. They range the gamut in age and socioeconomic status and, and health status and education. And this is a real crisis. This is something that we really need to get in charge of and in front of um, before it's too late. I'm 31 years old and I've never seen so many people my age talk about how they've survived cancer, how they've gotten tested for cancer, how they lost their mothers and grandfathers. This is something that is very serious and it's also something that we can we have the resources and the ability and the opportunity to change. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Demetri Gideon. Hi, um, I'm an intern with Clean Air Council, um, the Whitford Fellow at Chatham University's MFA program and a recipient of the Pittsburgh Schweitzer Environmental Fellowship. Um, when you get out of your car in Clareton, you can taste the air. It's thick, it coats your throat. In five minutes, you have a headache. If you look over to Clareton Coke Works, you can see flames and smoke that never stops. It's tinged blue. 
You don't need monitors or scientists to know it's wrong. It's harmful and it needs to stop. Um, Dr. Port Portlock, <laughs> um, you mentioned connecting numbers to health impacts, and that's why I got involved in this project, because live knowledge is as important as scientific evidence, and often those most impacted by pollution don't have a chance to speak. Um, since starting, I have met so many Claritin residents struggling to breathe, struggling with cancer, struggling with the loss of their loved ones. Um, I talked to a nine-year-old who had her first ever asthma attack in January. Um, and I'm just going to read you what one woman who grew up in Claritin told me. My father worked for U.S. Steel all of his life, and he passed away due to respiratory issues. I ended up with lung cancer. My upper right lobe was removed. I have COPD. Both of my sisters have COPD. Since I moved back to Claritin, I've had two more recurrences of cancer on my lungs. Right now, um, my gr girlfriend's great nephew is only six years old. They had to take him out of school three times since the year started to the hospital because he can't breathe. This is unacceptable. These are human beings, human beings who are part of our community and for whose health we're all responsible. It's unacceptable to tell children they just can't play outside. It's unacceptable that <coughs> residents can't open their windows at night. It's unacceptable that we allow a corporation to value their economic interests over human life. Residents have told me over and over again that they love Claritin and appreciate U.S. Steel. They simply want to breathe clean air. So I hope that ACHD and U.S. Steel can engage with residents in mutually accountable work and dialogue in order to address the problem now because they can't wait. Thank you. Uh, Don Nevels. Hi, my name is Don Nevels. I'm a 14-year Navy veteran, business owner in Pittsburgh and a resident of Clareton. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'd like to start by saying I understand what the mill means to this region. I grew up here, the roots run deep, I get it. However, for the life of me, I can't understand why there is always an argument when it comes to breathing clean air. This isn't about closing down the mill. It's not about taking away the livelihood of thousands of people. It's simply about finding a solution for a cleaner future. I've been here since the early 70s when we woke to what we called black snow that blanketed our communities. I remember using a snow brush to clean off my mom's car windshield from the layers of soot. I know we've come part way towards cleaner air, but we still have a long way to go. Clareton has a cancer rate 20% higher than the rest of the country. I've seen several friends and numerous citizens pass away from this disease myself. Personally, I suffer from severe asthma, which was controlled until I moved back to this region. I currently live six blocks from the Clareton Coke Works. Sometimes I walk outside to get in my car and the stench is so rancid, it throws me into an uncontrollable cough to a point of almost passing out. I'm on numerous inhalers and use a nebulizer daily, twice, to breathe easier. For nearly a century, U.S. Steel has reaped the rewards of industry with great profits at the expense of the people and their health. I think with the profits of $1.8 billion reported last year, they can afford to start replacing the three antiquated Coke oven batteries that are causing so many problems. Replacing those three batteries would greatly improve the quality of our air improve their commitment to the communities for the betterment of our health. The minimal fines aren't working, and since elected officials refuse to apply pressure because they fund their campaigns, we must rely on the health department to help the people. Please, after 100 years of the people's complaints falling on deaf ears of politicians, help us breathe easier and live longer by holding the industry accountable. We ask that the Board of Health and the ACHD move expeditiously to do what it can to prevent these unnecessary impacts and losses, we need the U.S. Steel to quickly implement the most cutting edge and latest technology improvements at the Clareton Coke Works facilities. We request that the ACHD advance updated Coke oven regulations as quickly as it can, incorporating world-class standards that prioritize public health. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rita Derrick. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I really don't have too much to add to what my peers have already said. I'm actually a relatively new resident of the Clarendon area, 
I moved from the Brookline area about um, eight months ago. And um, I'm just horrified by the change in air quality, even moving from inside the city in Brookline um, to that area. I was really kind of looking forward to slightly cleaner air, despite knowing that the Coke Works is right over the hill. Um, it's 2018, you just kind of think that things should be running as uh, smoothly that we wouldn't be able to smell it, but especially after the fire, um, I'm a runner. I, I stick my head out the window every morning now to find out at 6 a.m. ish if I'm gonna be able to run that day. Um, most often it's not anymore, so my health is declining. Um, uh, my, my physical fitness is declining. My health has already been declining because of the quality of the air. So I just wanna take the opportunity to thank um, the ACHD and um, ask you to please continue to put pressure along with the community on US Steel to do what, what's right, to really um, work to make Pittsburgh the vibrant community that I know it can be, that I want it to be, but I'm heartbroken when I hear that the um, air survey for um, the uh, American Lung Association, again, has given us Fs and all the standards. So I just ask you to continue to work with the community as you have. Thank you. Mark Dixon? I'm a little bit confused because the, uh, there was no Clareton Coke Works on the agenda forcing everybody to talk about Clareton Coke Works after the meeting, but you did definitely talk about Clareton Coke Works extensively during the meeting. Uh, we all have many questions, and without detailed ACHD information, we citizens are left to speculate, potentially degrading trust between the ACHD and the public. Instead, the main update we got lately from the ACHD was a letter glorifying yourselves for your great work improving air quality in 2018 to levels that do not meet the World Health Organization standards, claiming that it is a result of strong enforcement actions, fines, and penalties. But I'd like to put those penalties into perspective. I call them pizza penalties, and here's why. The fines assessed by the ACHD might, be, might as well be a rounding error on the books of U.S. Steel, which had net sales of over $14 billion in 2018. If translated roughly to the Allegheny County median household income, the ACHD, ACHD fines in 2018-2019 exceeding $3.4 million would come to about $12, or the price of a small pizza, one small pizza in two years. Meanwhile, residents who are forced to pay for asthma medications out of pocket can pay over 10 times that amount on an annual basis. And I have many more questions that I'd like to see you address, add to future agendas. On December 24th, you announced that US Steel had a fire at one of their gas dispatcher stations, but that you do not expect any air quality problems. How on earth did you arrive at that assessment? And by what methods have you confirmed US Steel has completed repairs? Can we see those reports? What will you do to make sure that this type of accident doesn't happen again? Did you examine regional asthma inhaler sales and prescriptions during the flaring? Did you inquire with school nurses about asthma incidents during the flaring? Were the free health screenings offered by U.S. Steel made available in a timely manner during the flaring or after? And have you confirmed how those bills were paid? Will you be adding any additional permanent air quality monitors to the area? And will you be requiring U.S. Steel to make technical changes to its Clareton Coke Works that enabled it to be hot idled quickly, like within hours instead of weeks or months? If not, why not? In my opinion, U.S. Steel's unwillingness to go to hot idle in spite of flagrant self-reported violations of air quality laws reads to me as a sign of disrespect to you and the entire community. U.S. Steel sto stood boldly above the law and rendered your governing authority impotent when citizens needed you most. The ACHD needs to look beyond the simple issuance of an enforcement order to mandate compliance with local laws. By my reading, the county regulations permit you to revoke U.S. Steel's operating permit or initiate a criminal proceeding, among many other options. And if you have any doubts that the events at U.S. Steel warrant more serious action on your part, just ask the lawyers that filed three lawsuits in the past few weeks, including a class action lawsuit that claims U.S. Steel was negligent and the company's conduct was reckless. U.S. Steel's criminal behavior must be stopped using all means at your disposal, even if they're creative, confrontational, and or controversial. It's time to get past pathetic pizza penalties. Air quality better than it used to be is no longer good enough. We demand clean air now. He's absent. Okay, next is Fred Bickerton. Okay. My name is Fred Beckerton. My family moved into the Clareton area in the early 1800s. We've had seven generations of Beckertons lived in this area. At least the last six have had serious health problems, definitely related to the U.S. Steelworks. Cancer, 
respiratory problems. And what does U.S. still do whenever there's a problem? They fight. The penalties have been a joke. I mean, it's like the township fining me five dollars to because I parked my car in front of the house overnight. Paid five dollars, no big deal. Unfortunately, the health department can't find them what they need to be fined. But what you need to be doing is taking action against them to force them to change their operation, to modernize their equipment, or to shut down if they refuse to. You know, we're facing another issue with the power plant. Let's put an application in. We've got the worst air quality in the country. Why are we even considering letting a power plant move into the area too? On top of the problems with U.S. Steel. We're asking for your help. We'd like to have clean air. I've got grandchildren and hopefully some great-grandchildren coming. I'd like to, for them to have things a little better than what I've had. It. Hi, my name is Melanie Mead. I've been a longtime resident of Clareton. I am currently working on my naturopathic degree, and I've been a caregiver for the last 12 years. Um, my eldest brother passed away at 2011 from heart failure. My mother and father passed away in the same year, 2013. <coughs> Um, my mother had chronic kidney and heart failure. My father had chronic heart failure. And my sister passed away in 2015 of lung cancer. Um, so I'm thankful that I have the opportunity to speak here. And I'd like to ask the health department to move faster and more swift because families, families like mine are uh, leaving and we don't have anyone left. I am 44 years old and I have a younger brother who is 40 years old who lives in Washington, DC. And our community is left without the knowledge and wisdom that my family members had been sharing and offering to the community. So we lose a lot when we lose these people, uh, not just in their physical uh, absence, but their capacity to bring things together and collaborate with others. That's what we lose when we have such a high rate of uh, death in our community. The U.S. still has monies to implement better technology. The four batteries, there was a time that I had heard that they were given money to complete the fixes on those batteries. And here we sit years later and they're still out of compliance and they're not fixed. When you talk about getting $5 million in grant funding for opioid, and in a community like Clareton, we need to be looking at the air pollution and its relation with the violence. So th there's a study uh, from the care2.com site. Uh, one of the scientists said that the pure air, the pure are actions. And that's what they found when they looked at air, high air pollution areas. They would find high mugging rates where there was a lot of smog. So when you look at Clareton, when you just, we just recently had uh, 18 to 20 uh, students um, being charged because they were unable to uh, protest nonviolently. Uh, these type of incidents lead to something and we need to take a, a clearer look at the air pollution and how it's negatively and adversely affecting our children and their futures for after they become adults. We need to take this into consideration because the opioid addiction, parents being uh, opioid addicts, raising children with asthma uh, have really devastated our community and it devastates the quality of life for our children and they deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, I'm back here to let you know that the proof is in the pudding. I dusted my window ledge above my bed two days ago, just two days. And here is your sulfur dioxide on my window ledge above my bed that I get to breathe every night. We are on the FIBA. That's the forward edge of the battle area. And we are under a chemical attack 
from a domestic enemy, which is U.S. Steel. And they don't care about us. Who's going to pay for the property they damage? Every house in Glassport, if you look at the shutters, if they had brown shutters, they're now orange. If you look at the white houses that have the brown shutters, you have orange goop running all the way down the sides of your house. I also, they have killed my pine trees. They have killed my ewes. Ewes are bushes, okay? That's money that I have to replace. I have to replace shutters. I have to replace my tree. I gotta get somebody to come and scrub down my house. I have a blue black funk on the side of my house that's in these pictures after this meeting is over. I would like every one of you people on this board to look at these pictures. I want you to see that they are killing vegetation. And basically, we all deserve to breathe clean air. We don't deserve to breathe a black mist that you can't see until you cough it up the next morning. That's not cool. I'm done now. Thank you. And I didn't slam my jar this time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John Perryman. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Johnny Perryman. I moved into Claritin from Seattle, Washington 12 years ago. And uh, this pollution uh, I've, everyone I've talked to just about talk about the same symptoms that I have. And uh, I went to my doctor uh, since the last time I was here to find out uh, what can be done. And he, he said, he checked my blood and my kidneys were fine, my liver was fine. He just gave me a bill of health on a lot of things, but he said that uh, He's going to check my thyroid, and if it's not my thyroid, I should just get out of town. I should just move. And so they checked my thyroid, and my thyroid is fine, which indicates that I should leave Claritin, leave my home, and just go somewhere else. Uh, in uh, uh, October, I'm going to go down to Peru to see uh, 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 plant medicine expert try to clean all this stuff out of my system that I breathe in here at Claritin. And you could have a clean day, but you're still dealing with the stuff that you breathe the days before. And so it don't just all go away because you have a clean day. My question has been before that legislator that lunch another day is, can the Claritin coat works be fixed? If it can't be fixed, then it should be shut down. If it can be fixed, then the question is, how long would it take them to fix them? If they can't fix it by that length of time, it should be shut down. It, it, it indicates that they either don't want to fix it or they, or they don't care. And, and I, I go through a lot of my days uh, being real close to just passing out. I don't know if I'm going to pass out or not. I've sat here in this room today wondering if I was going to pass out. And I don't know if I'm going to be around come October when it's time to, uh, to go to Peru. But I think that uh, uh, Claritin Works should accept responsibility for what they're doing to the people here. Uh, I wear a uh, uh, gas mask every day. And, uh, and after a while, you know, there's probably bacteria that builds up in it. 30 seconds. And I, and, and I spray it with the hydrogen peroxide and wipe it down. But I don't know if that cleans it. Uh, one day I'll have to ask my question, ask myself the question: Am I real sick today because of the air in the pollution, or is it the gas mask that I'm wearing with the bacteria in it trying to abort that pollution? Thank you, Doreen mm -hmm. Love. Just out here in RSK. Okay, thank you, um, <coughs> Patricia. Armstead uh, Daniels. Well, my name is Pat Armstead Daniels. I'm a resident of Glassport for just two years, so my story is not as long as some. However, it's, it's every bit as critical. I had a dream uh, for years of retiring after a 40-year 
career as a registered nurse and coming back home to Pittsburgh, which I did. As a matter of fact, seven of those years I spent as a public health nurse with Allegheny County Health Department. Um, my dream is turned into a nightmare. Little did I know when I moved to Glassport that this is what I would have to deal with. Bad air daily. I don't go outside and I'm an outside person. I used to do a lot of gardening, which is why I bought the home that I did buy because I had a yard. I can't get out into that yard because I live right across the river from the Clarendon Works and it's so hard to breathe. I don't open up my windows anymore because let's face it, I'm 68 and I can't keep scrubbing window seals every day to get the black coat dust that blows in when I open my windows. If I didn't have whole house air, I don't know what I would do. I'm just begging you, um, members of the uh, health department, please do all you can to give us the clean air that we deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hannah Bightley, I hope we are somewhat close, close with this girl. Thank you. Um, and let's say Allegheny. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hannah, and um, I work for Women for a Healthy Environment, um, a nonprofit located in East Liberty. And I'm the coordinator of our uh, countywide coalition, uh, Let's Safe Allegheny. Um, we wanted to take this opportunity to thank the health department. A um, little bit of background in May of 2018, uh, Women for a Healthy Environment hosted a LED conference, and from that event, um, we had convened community organizations and nonprofits to identify strategies um, and resources to address lead exposure in our region. Uh, throughout the course of planning and coordinating these community groups, uh, we recognized that um, we needed to extend our reach and broaden our coalition to include additional sectors and individuals that are impacted and deal with lead exposure every day. In 2019, um, the health department collaborated with Women for Healthy Environment to secure um, a health and all policies grant from the National Center for Healthy Housing. Um, and this grant and, and funding has provided valuable resources uh, to launch the countywide coalition led Safe Allegheny. Uh, this coalition is still in the early stages of establishing ourselves and um, continues to grow, but currently membership includes local and community-based nonprofits, government agencies, including the Health Department and Economic Development, uh, city and county housing authorities, early intervention programs, managed care organizations, local contractors and trainers, and health care providers. Um, this coalition works collectively with one common goal to decrease the number and percent of children exposed to lead and to increase the volume of housing stock that is lead safe and lead free. Uh, Let's Save Allegheny strives to provide leadership and advocacy that advances strategic initiatives and collaboration among the community by focusing on primary prevention and creating lead safe homes. The coalition recognizes that dedicated resources are needed for lead testing and screening, lead hazard control and abatement, uh, community education and organizing, um, creating safe and affordable housing options, and, create, um, and implementing lead safe work practices and trainings. On behalf of Women for Health Environment and Let's Safe Allegheny, we wanted to take this opportunity to recognize and thank the Health Department for being a collaborative, inclusive, and committed partner in establishing this coalition and prioritizing lead exposure in Allegheny County. It has been an incredible experience working with Dr. Hacker, Luann, and the folks at um, Housing and Community Environment, and we look forward to continuing this partnership to work toward a lead safe Allegheny County. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Richter. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is going to seem really insignificant <laughs> after hearing everybody's uh, comments and speeches, but uh, I'm here today. My, my name is Jeremy Richter. I'm here today to speak on behalf of Rico Incorporated. We're a merit um, employee-owned plumbing contracting company in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. We are also located, you know, in Allegheny County. I'm a registered master plumber, and I uh, hold a position on the management committee of the company. In April of this year, it came to my attention through ca casual conversation with one of my apprentices uh, concerning his journeyman's exam that the test was apparently moved from the previous location in South Park to the local 27 Union Hall. This is for non-union and union uh, apprentices. From what we were informed, this was done three years ago without any notification given to the, our company, even though we're active members of AMPAC, which is the Association of Master Plumbers of Allegheny County. This was done due to site conditions of the previous building, along with costs associated with obtaining a new facility to take this exam. Rich Brosco, the president of my company, and I reached out to Tim Mahoney, who holds the title of Plumbing Supervisor of Allegheny County Southwest Plumbing Division. 
we were told through Tim that Andy Greasy, the former <coughs> chief plumbing inspector, cut this deal with Local 27 to utilize their hall for the journeyman and master plumbing exam each year. Also in the agreement was the fact that no solicitation of any non-union or union employees was to take place at this exam. I'm here today because this agreement was not honored. In fact, uh, two of our apprentices after this last taste test in April were directly solicited by the BA of the Local 27 during break during the test. They were asked if they were looking for a job, both of them stated no. They were asked, were they happy with their benefits? They both stated yes. They were, they were asked, were they happy with their wages? They both stated yes. They were handed a business card along with uh, the statement that if things change and they will, please contact us. Excuse me. Uh, directors and uh, board members, along with training over 60 to 80 apprentices at a time in our company at all times, we're an active member in the McKeesport uh, community. We hire a lot of local kids and uh, put them through this examination, put them through their apprenticeship, and send them out as journeymen and leaders with our company. So for four years, we put these kids out through the apprenticeship. We, tr we incur tremendous expense paying for each semester of these apprentices' school to attend the Allegheny <coughs> County Plumbing Apprenticeship School. I'm asking today, along with all other merit plumbing contractors in Allegheny County, that the exam is relocated to a neutral site where we can send our apprentices to take the exam without the pressure of union solicitation. The Palisades is a facility, the Palisades is a facility in McKeesport that can accommodate over 250 people. It's very accessible with a rate of around three to $400. If this is something in which the county cannot accommodate in their budget, I'm sure that we could come to an agreement in which we as contractors can provide this facility at no cost for the county. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, but he's asking. Uh, Mary Ann Marnick. <clears throat> Good afternoon, all. My name's Mary Ann Marnick. I'm from McKees Rocks, PA. I live in Stowe Township. I live 100, 100 feet away from McKees Rocks Industrial Enterprise. It's right across the street from my home. To the right of me is CXX. To the left of me is another railroad, Conrail. Behind me is Butler Gas. Not within a mile's radius is Gordon Oil and Pepsi Cola, and at many other businesses within McKees Rocks Industrial Enterprises. Since, 2007, since 2006, McKees Rocks Industrial Enterprise has been hauling silicate graphite. That is used for fracking, okay? It is a very dangerous mineral, okay? It causes silicosis within the lungs. Since 2017, I lost two family members. My brother, which lived in Brighton Heights, <laughs> and my honey, which lived with me. They both died from this. Now, Mr. Kelly, I listened to your speech and I don't know where the monitors are, but I really wish there was a monitor within my area. And if Allegheny County Health Department can help with this issue, it would be much appreciative because within six years, not even six years, within one year, depletion of our area in Stowe Township went from 12,000 people to 6,000. That's a shame. How many children are being hurt from this? Who has the right to open up a business without a permit or license, but gets a million dollar grant from Allegheny County and don't have a business or a permit? It's still pending and investigations are still pending. Now I've talked with everyone with the EPA in Allegheny County. I've went to fracking sites in Butler County and in Washington County. They have two inspectors when silicate graphite is being used and everyone has respirators on. Here's me, I'm sitting on my front porch, bringing it in, and I'm talking billowing clouds. Yes, they did clean it up with that $1,500 fine. But, 30 where are the monitors? That's what I would like to know. And if we can get one in our area, it would be much appreciative. Thank you very much for your time. And God bless y'all. Thank you. <clears throat>
Krista Gogler. I'm guessing I did not I'm going to try to do this short and sweet because, as you can tell, I'm losing my voice. Um, I live less than five miles from the Claritin Coke work plants. <clears throat> um, just about every evening, there's a spike over <clears throat> 100 p.m. Um, 100 on the p.m. 2.5 scale. <clears throat> just on Sunday, it reached 463. My kids cannot play outside. Their eyes and throats burn weekly. It is no wonder why I'm currently using an inhaler, struggling to breathe and talk to you today. I wasn't going to speak, but listening to all these people that came out today and seeing all these faces, I had to force myself to talk to you today. U.S. Steel has not been compliant since they've so-called fixed their air scrubbers. <clears throat> I and we, requ we request stronger regulations and requirements for U.S. Steel and for the, U, um, I'm sorry, for the Allegheny County Health Department to take a stronger stand for all of us. A lot of people couldn't make it to here today. My kids obviously are in school. They can't be here to talk to you. Um, but when my seven-year-old comes home from school and tells me that they weren't allowed to go outside to play today because the air quality was too bad, or my 12-year-old looks to see if he can wear shorts um, on his weather app on his phone and the first thing he notices that it's a bad air quality day and he texts me from right down the street at the bus stop and tells me that he can smell the coke ass in the air. It's a shame. I've lived there since 2008 um, right on the border of Jefferson Hills and Clareton. Basically my backyard um, is right look oversees the coke work plants. Um, the Irvine plant, even though they like to say that their, <clears throat> their emergency flares only one run once a week, they're on darn near 24 seven. I call it my urban sunset. It is on the opposite side of my view from my back backyard. It literally looks like the sun is setting and I have pictures to prove it and video as well. Please, I request that you put stronger regulations and requirements against U.S. Steel because they're not in compliance. You can see that on the monitors every evening. Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker is Kurt Barshik uh, about the desulfurization process. So good afternoon, I'm Kurt Barshik. I'm the general manager for the Mon Valley Works. First, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the Board of Health members, Dr. Shapira, Dr. Harrison, and Mr. Ferraro, who were able to visit our Clareton Coking operations on April 9th and tour our facility. I hope you enjoyed seeing firsthand our employees produce coke on the batteries and observe the fully restarted operations of the Clareton Number 2 control room and our coke oven gas desulfurization process. The entire Clareton team would like to thank you for visiting. I'd also like to extend this opportunity to other board members who could not make it that day. Please do not hesitate to call me or my staff. We welcome that opportunity. I'm pleased to report that the number two control room repairs were completed 11 days ahead of schedule with eight actual compressors online. Just today, we restarted our ninth compressor. In addition, we took that opportunity during the fire repairs to make the additional upgrades to our gas cleaning and byproducts recovery units, and they're in fact better than ever. U.S. Steel continues to monitor the data from the data from the local air monitors, including the Liberty monitor, and we're encouraged by the SO2 data since the restart of the number two control room operations. There have been zero exceedances at Liberty, Clareton, North Braddock, and West Mifflin monitors since the restart. Likewise, U.S. Steel was very encouraged to see that our efforts have had an impact on a demonstrated downward trend in PM 2.5 at the Liberty Monitor. The 2018 data is now in for the Liberty Monitor. It's complete and we achieved an 11.5 micrograms per meter cubed versus the new standard set in 2012 of 12. 
I am pleased to report that U.S. Fuel Clearing Plant has certified compliance as required by the 2016 consent judgment on April 1st, 2019. All 10 batteries have certified compliance greater than 98.5 for the Allegheny County Health Department stack capacity standard. I'm also pleased to report that the Clarence plant has met the requirements for the June 2018 enforcement order for the first quarter and we're on target for the second quarter to comply with those requirements. We are extremely pleased with our performance. We continue to focus on our performance with the goals of minimizing emissions. And I'll just conclude by saying, we have committed to do more. Stay tuned very soon because our best performance is yet to come. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other um, things? What's that? Board wants to mention or? Okay, great. Uh, guys. I just wanted to review the amount of fines that we can charge. Can we just talk a little bit about um, uh, where those limits are set? We have a you know we have a civil penalty policy and it's very transparent and it speaks to a whole variety of qual uh, qualifications, up to twenty five thousand dollars a day. The federal uh, rate is much higher. Uh, we've actually asked the legislator con to consider raising the daily rate. We have not heard of any legislators who are putting that through. The, I'm talking about the state the legislature. Day. Yeah, the DEP um, actually would like to raise those rates as well, um, but I have not heard of anything that has been put through as yet. So um, we have been using those new civil penalty policies for the last it's, it's, year. It's been over a year. And that has yeah. literally, I think, doubled our by our fines. I think it's about double them in terms of what no, they were. It's kind of hard. All fines are not yeah. equal. Right. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Different qualifying. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Can I have a motion for adjournment? I'd like to propose a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for joining in, Caroline, from, from a